Animal Farm, Chapter 2. Three nights later, Old Major died peacefully in his sleep. His body was buried at the foot of the orchard. This was early in March. During the next three months, there was much secret activity. Major's speech had given to the more intelligent animals on the farm a completely new outlook on life. They did not know when the rebellion predicted by Major would take place. They had no reason for thinking that it would be within their own lifetime. But they saw clearly that it was their duty to prepare for it. The work of teaching and organizing the others fell naturally upon the pigs, who were generally recognized as being the cleverest or smartest of the animals. Preeminent among the pigs were two young boars named Snowball and Napoleon, whom Mr. Jones was breeding up for sale. Uh, please remember that preeminent, one of your vocab words, means that, you know, they're kind of the alphas, they're the leaders, they're the most important. Napoleon was a large, rather fierce-looking Berkshire boar, the only Berkshire on the farm, not much of a talker, but with a reputation for getting his own way. Snowball was a more vivacious pig than Napoleon, quicker in speech and more inventive, but was not considered to have the same depth of character. After this paragraph, I'm going to recommend you pause the video to start taking some notes. These are going to be really critical characters, and you're going to want to jot down information about their character traits and about their appearance, and I'll uh, show you some images that will help with that as well. Okay. So, um, anyway, we've, we've got that um, vocab word, vivacious, as well. So we've just described Snowball and Napoleon. All the other male pigs on the farm were porkers, ones that are destined to become dinner. The best known among them was a small fat pig named Squealer, and take notes on him, with very round cheeks, twinkling eyes, nimble or quick little movements, and a shrill, kind of high-pitched voice. He was a brilliant talker, and when he was arguing some difficult point, he had a way of kind of skipping from side to side and whisking his tail, which was somehow very persuasive. The others said of Squealer that he could turn black into white, meaning he could take some information that maybe thinks symbolism, right, is black, symbolically black, and turn it white, symbolically pure, positive, good. So I want you to definitely jot down that quote with a citation about Squealer. Uh, so let's visualize this a little bit. Uh, we've got a Berkshire boar in Napoleon, and it, spe it specifies that he's the only Berkshire on the farm. The thing that really distinguishes a Berkshire boar from the others is that his fur is going to be black in color, uh, whereas Old Major was a middle white, where he had white fur. Uh, Napoleon has black fur. Uh, Snowball is also, um, like Old Major, a pig that is light in color. Now, these are not, you know, specifically the pictures that George Orwell would have selected, but these are pretty good uh, references that you can kind of visualize these animals looking like. Um, and so a porker, I wanted to make sure that you understood, um, would be more of the kind of pig that you're used to seeing in, like, cartoons or books with, like, the curly little tail. Uh, these are ones that are destined for dinner. Uh, Snowball and Napoleon had their genitals completely intact because, as it says in the text, um, Mr. Jones is... Um, going to sell them. He was breeding them up for sale, likely for them to be breeding stock so that they, like Old Major, would have many, many children. Porkers, on the other hand, um, I don't know if you notice the absence of material here where I'm indicating. Um, I'm not doing that to be gross. That is because porkers would generally have their testicles removed which would therefore limit their amount of testosterone, the male hormone that can cause aggression in animals and in people. Uh, so when you think of Squealer's shrill voice, uh, high-pitched voice, you're going to think of maybe the voice of a, a young man who hasn't hit puberty and won't. Um, and remember in the previous chapter, um, we had had Old Major indicate that the porkers would die that year, would be turned into hams and bacon and 
all that jazz uh, within the year. So we've got three very important characters just introduced. These three had elaborated or added on to Old Major's teachings into a complete system of thought to which they gave the name of animalism. Several nights a week after Mr. Jones was asleep, they held secret meetings in the barn that expounded or kind of brought forth the principles of animalism to the others. At the beginning, they met with much stupidity and apathy. Remember, apathy meaning not caring. Some of the animals talked, to, talked of the duty of loyalty to Mr. Jones, whom they referred to as master, or made elementary remarks, kind of childish remarks, such as, Mr. Jones feeds us. If he were gone, we should starve to death. Others ask such questions as, why should we care what happens after we are dead? Or, if this rebellion is to happen anyway, what difference does it make whether we work for it or not? And the pigs had great difficulty in making them see that this was contrary or opposite to the spirit of animalism. The stupidest questions of all were asked by Molly, the white mare. The very first question she asked Snowball was, will there still be sugar after the rebellion? No said Snowball firmly. We have no means of making sugar on this farm. Besides, you do not need sugar. You will have all the oats and hay you want. And shall I still be allowed to wear ribbons in my mane? And mane is kind of the lengthy hair that a horse has. Uh, if we kind of go back to our picture of Molly that we had before, the mane is would take the place of her hair if she were a human being. Uh, and so she's asking if she can still wear ribbons. Comrade, which means friend or um, kind of partner, said Snowball, those ribbons you are so devoted to are the badge of slavery. Can you not understand that liberty is worth more than ribbons? Molly agreed, but she did not sound very convinced. The pigs had an even harder struggle to counteract or battle the lies put about by Moses, the tame raven. Moses, who was Mr. Jones' special pet, was a spy and a tale-bearer, but he was also a clever talker, and you're going to want to add this information uh, to your character tracker as well. He claimed to know of the existence of a mysterious country called Sugar Candy Mountain, to which all animals went when they died. It was situated somewhere up in the sky, a little distance beyond the clouds, Moses said. In Sugar Candy Mountain, it was Sunday seven days a week, Sunday being the day of rest. Clover, or maybe the tastiest grass, was in season all the year round, and lump sugar and linseed cake grew on the hedges. Lump sugar um, being, right, just lumps of sugar, literally, and linseed cake being almost like a sweet muffin, grew on the hedges or the bushes. The animals hated Moses because he told tales and did no work, but some of them believed in Sugar Candy Mountain, and the pigs had to argue very hard to persuade them that there was no such place. Uh, now, taking a moment, I wanted to share with you um, some images that might help, and I'm not going to play this video for you. If you would like to uh, watch that, I'm going to encourage you to go find the Picture Aid slideshow. It's on Google Classroom in the Animal Farm Materials. Um, but this is what a linseed cake would look like, kind of a cross between a muffin and one of those crumbly granola bars, and lump sugar, right, just lumps of sugar. Uh, but this video is um, kind of the human version of Sugar Candy Mountain, uh, and this is called the Big Rock Candy Mountain, and it is a very silly song. Uh, so let's, let's continue. Their most faithful disciples, so their most faithful students of the, of the pigs, were the two cart horses, Boxer and Clover. Now make sure you're taking good notes about these two as well. These two had great difficulty in thinking anything out for themselves, but having once accepted the pigs as their teachers, they absorbed everything that they were told and passed it on to the other animals by simple arguments. They were unfailing in their attendance. They always showed up at the secret meetings in the barn, and led the singing of Beasts of England, with which the meetings always ended. You'll remember the song that I so graciously sang for you. They were the leaders of it. Now, as it turned out, the rebellion was achieved much earlier and more easily than anyone had expected. In past years, Mr. Jones, although a hard master, had been a capable farmer, but of late he had fallen on evil days, meaning that things had gone badly for him. 
He had become much disheartened, or lost some of his enthusiasm, after losing money in a lawsuit, and had taken, drink and taken to drinking more than was good for him. For whole days at a time, he would lounge in his Windsor chair in the kitchen, reading the newspapers, drinking, and occasionally feeding Moses on crusts of bread soaked in beer. His men were idle, they were lazy and dishonest. The fields were full of weeds. The buildings wanted roofing, they needed new roofs. The hedges were neglected, and the animals were underfed. Now, if you were to take a moment and make a prediction, think about what happens when an animal is underfed. Might not go so good. Uh, let's take a moment to visualize. Uh, so this is what a Windsor chair would look like. It's, it's just a, a chair that would be fairly ordinary at that time in history. And hedges are going to be a, um, a row of bushes that's going to be used in place of a fence. So it's a natural fence that uh, would keep your animals in, but um, wouldn't prevent like foxes from getting in, but would keep your cows from like wandering elsewhere. So June came and the hay was almost ready for cutting. On Midsummer's Eve, which is uh, June 21st, which was a Saturday, Mr. Jones went into Willingdon, uh, the town, and got so drunk at the Red Lion, which would be a bar, that he did not come back till midday on Sunday. So he went out on the, the eve, uh, so the 21st on Saturday, and he did not come back until the very next day at midday, like 12 noon afterwards, right? The men had milked the cows in the early morning and then had gone out rabbiting or hunting rabbits without bothering to feed the animals. When Mr. Jones got back, he immediately went to sleep on the drawing room or living room sofa with the news of the world over his face, so that when the evening came, the animals were still unfed. At last, they could stand it no longer. One of the cows broke in the door of the store shed with her horn, and all the animals began to help themselves from the bin. It was just then that Mr. Jones woke up. The next moment, he and his four men were in the store shed with whips in their hands, lashing out in all directions. This was more than the hungry animals could bear. With one accord, all together, though nothing of the kind had been planned beforehand, they flung themselves upon their tormentors, Jones and his men. Uh, I'm sorry, they flung themselves upon their tormentors. Jones and his men suddenly found themselves being butted and kicked from all sides. The situation was quite out of control. They had never seen animals behave like this before, and this sudden uprising of creatures, whom they were used to thrashing or hitting and maltreating, just as they chose, frightened them almost out of their wits. Almost until they were dumb, right? After only a moment or two, they gave up trying to defend themselves and took to their heels. They ran away. A minute later, all five of them were in full flight down the cart track that led to the main road, with the animals pursuing them in triumph. So, this is it, y'all. This is... This is the revolution. They, they kicked out the, the humans. Mrs. Jones looked out of the bedroom window, saw what was happening, hurriedly flung a few possessions into a carpet bag, which would just be kind of like her overnight bag, basically, and slipped out of the farm by another way. Moses sprang off his perch and flapped after her, croaking loudly. Meanwhile, the animals had chased Jones and his men out onto the road and slammed the five-barred gate behind them. And so, almost before they knew what was happening, the rebellion had been successfully carried through. Jones was expelled, and the manor farm was theirs. Let's take a, a moment to visualize. So when we're, when we're talking about midsummer, we're talking about June 21st, and the hay is just going to be basically long, um, long grass that today you'd use basically a very large lawnmower to cut, and that would be dried out and used as feed for the animals all winter. And then feed bins would help to store some of that material um, throughout the year. Uh, so that's what the animals kind of helped themselves to after going a full day without being fed. And a carpet bag would just be a bag that looks like it's made out of carpet. It's uh, just a, a kind of overnight bag. She basically took some luggage with her so she would have it with her. Uh, and this is what a five-barred gate looks like. It's literally got one, two, three, four, five bars on it. And it would just be the gate that would be down at the end of the driveway, right before the road. All right, so Jones was expelled and the manor farm was there. So the manor farm is the name of where they live, right? For the first few minutes, the animals could hardly believe in their good fortune. Their first act was to gallop in a body right round the boundaries of the farm, to run right around it, 
as though to make quite sure that no human being was hiding anywhere upon it. Then they raced back to the farm buildings to wipe out the last traces of Jones's hated rain. The harness room at the end of the stables was broken open. The bits, the nose rings, the dog chains, the cruel knives with, with which Mr. Jones had been used to castrate the pigs and lambs were all flung down the well. The well would be where they would get water from. So to fling stuff down the well, um, this is going to be a very, very deep hole. So it's, it's not coming back up out of there. Uh, so they flung those down the, the well. The reins, the halters, the blinkers, the degrading nose bags were thrown onto the rubbish fire, the trash fire, which was burning in the yard. So were the whips. All the animals capered or kind of ran around happily with joy when they saw the whips going up in flames. Snowball also threw onto the fire the ribbons with which the horses' manes and tails had usually been decorated on market days. Ribbons, he said, should be considered as clothes, which are the mark of a human being. All animals should go naked. When Boxer heard this, he fetched or went to get the small straw hat which he wore in summer to keep the flies out of his ears and flung it onto the fire with the rest. Now that's, I want you to pause and, and really think about that, right? He has this, this tool that actually serves a purpose. It's not like Molly's ribbons that just make her feel prettier. He, he uses this hat to keep the flies out of his ears in the summer. But Boxer is so devoted to the, the farm and the rebellion that he decides to get rid of even that useful thing. Uh, in a very little while, the animals had destroyed everything that reminded them of Mr. Jones. Napoleon then led them back to the store shed and served out a double ration or amount of corn to everybody with two biscuits for each dog. Then they sang Beasts of England from end to end seven times running. And after that, they settled down for the night and slept as they had never slept before. But they woke at dawn as usual, and suddenly remembering the glorious thing that had happened, they all raced out into the pasture together. A little way down the pasture, there was a knoll or a small hill that commanded a view of most of the farm. The animals rushed to the top of it and gazed round them in the clear morning light. Yes, it was theirs. Everything that they could see was theirs. In the ecstasy, the extreme joy of that thought, they gambled, ran around like, like wild people, round and round. They, they ran round and round, just so excited. They hurled themselves into the air in great leaps of excitement. They rolled in the dew. They cropped or bit up mouthfuls of the sweet summer grass. They kicked up clods or bits of the black earth and snuffed its rich scent. Then they made a tour of inspection of the whole farm and surveyed or kind of took in all the, the with speechless admiration, the plowland, the hayfield, the orchard, the pool, the spinney, uh, which is just another building on a farm. It was as though they had never seen these things before, and even now they could hardly believe that it was all their own. Then they filed back to the farm buildings and halted in silence outside the door of the farmhouse. That was theirs too, but they were frightened to go inside. After a moment, however, Snowball and Napoleon butted the door open with their shoulders, and the animals entered in single file, walking with the utmost care for fear of disturbing anything. They tiptoed from room to room, afraid to speak above a whisper, and gazing with a kind of awe, or almost surprise, at the unbelievable luxury. At the beds with their feather mattresses, the looking glasses or mirrors, the horsehair sofa, the Brussels carpet, the lithograph of Queen Victoria over the drawing room mantelpiece. Let me show you a picture of that. Uh, so this is a horsehair sofa, so it would look like a, an ordinary kind of couch with a covering. But inside, it wouldn't be stuffed with foam like we have today. It would be stuffed with horse hair. Um, so just like we had talked earlier about the knacker using up the animal's bodies for all sorts of purposes, including glue, this is what they would use the hair for. And this is kind of the picture, right? The Brussels carpet would look a little bit like this, like a very um, elaborate design. A lithograph is an old school uh, kind of photograph. A mantelpiece is the fireplace, and the drawing room is the living room, or like the sitting room. Uh, queen Victoria would have been the Queen of England at this time, uh, so we can assume that this is the late 1800s to the very early 1900s. So I'm, I'm in my mind, assigning a, um, a date of maybe 1890s to this time. So uh, back to it. They were just coming down the stairs when Molly was discovered to be missing. Oh no. 
Going back, the others found that she had remained behind in the best bedroom. She had taken a piece of blue ribbon from Mrs. Jones's dressing table and was holding it against her shoulder and admiring herself in the glass in the mirror in a very foolish manner. So this is what a, um, a dressing table would look like or a vanity. And um, it sounds like Molly just kind of picked up a ribbon and was like, oh, look how pretty I am. Oh, it's so nice looking. Ah, oh, it's so cute. All right, so how did the others feel? Well, they were not okay with it. The others reproached or yelled at her sharply, and they went outside. Some hams, or some pig meat, hanging in the kitchen, were taken out for burial, and the barrel of beer in the scullery, remember the beer barrel back in the kitchen, was stove in, was crunched in with a kick from Boxer's hoof. Otherwise, nothing in the house was untouched. A unanimous, a, a completely agreed resolution was passed on the spot that the farmhouse should be preserved as a museum. All were agreed that no animal must ever live there. The animals had their breakfast, and then Snowball and Napoleon called them together again. Comrades, said Snowball, it is half past six, and we have a long day before us. Today, we begin the hay harvest. But there is another matter that must be attended to first. The pigs now revealed that during the past three months, they had taught themselves to read and write from an old spelling book which had belonged to Mr. Jones's children and which had been thrown on the rubbish heap or the trash pile. Napoleon sent for pots of black and white paint and led the way down to the five-barred gate that gave onto the main road, so down to the, the very entrance to the farm where, they could, where it could be seen by anybody riding up and down the road. Then Snowball, for it was Snowball who was best at riding, took a brush between the two knuckles of his trotter. Remember, the trotter is kind of the two chunky-looking finger things that uh, pigs have instead of hooves. So he took the paintbrush between the two knuckles of his trotter, painted out Animal Farm from the top bar of the gate, and in its place painted Animal Farm. This was to be the name of the farm from now onwards. After this, they went back to the farm buildings, where Snowball and Napoleon sent for a ladder, which they caused to be set against the end wall of the big barn. They explained that by their studies of the past three months, the pigs had succeeded in reducing the principles or main ideas of animalism to seven commandments. Now, if you're starting to already connect this to the biblical ten commandments, that's great. Just hold that in your mind. Keep that together. These seven commandments would, would now be inscribed or written on the wall. They would form an unalterable law, an unchanging law, by which all the animals on Animal Farm must live forever after. With some difficulty, for it is not easy for a pig to balance himself on a ladder, Snowball climbed up and set to work, with Squealer a few rungs below him holding the paint pot. The commandments were written on the tarred wall, so the wall was black with tar, which would have been a natural protectant from the rain. So uh, the commandments were written on the tarred wall in great white letters that could be read 30 yards away. They ran thus, the seven commandments. Whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. Whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. No animal shall wear clothes. No animal shall sleep in a bed. No animal shall drink alcohol. No animal shall kill any other animal. All animals are equal. Make sure you write this down. It may be, oh, yep, yeah, it's question number six in chapter two. So make sure that you um, do a really good job of just capturing those. Make sure you catch a page number. It was very neatly written, and except that friend was written friend, and one of the S's was the wrong way round, the spelling was correct all the way through. Snowball read it aloud for the benefit of the others. All the animals nodded in complete agreement, and the cleverer ones at once began to learn the commandments by heart. Now, comrades, cried Snowball, throwing down the paintbrush, to the hay field. Let us make it a point of honor to get in the harvest more quickly than Jones and his men could do. Now, before we move on, I want to point out honor here has a U in it. And you might have noticed earlier that uh, there was a word that would normally have used a Z, but it had an S. Uh, so this is a good time to point out that this book was written by a British author. And in uh, England, in Great Britain, they have slightly different spelling conventions. Um, for instance, honor has a U in it. It's not spelled wrong. You don't need to add that U. You can do it the American way. Doesn't matter that much. Uh, so, he wants them to get the harvest in more quickly than Jones and his men could do. 
But at this moment, the three cows, who had seemed uneasy or uncomfortable for some time past, set up a loud lowing, right? They started mooing loudly. They had not been milked for 24 hours, and their udders, their parts that hold milk, were almost bursting, right? So cows, once they're, once a cow, like, has produced milk, it has to be milked. Otherwise, it's, it's either going to get an infection or, like, hurt a lot. Uh, you see this with um, women post-pregnancy as well. If they're lactating, they start to become very uncomfortable when it's time to feed the baby again. Uh, so these poor cows, it's been a whole day. They would normally be milked in the morning and the evening. And now it's been, wow, super long time. And their udders were almost bursting. After a little thought, the pigs sent for buckets and milked the cows fairly successfully, their trotters being well adapted to this task. Soon there were five buckets of frothing, creamy milk at which many of the animals looked with considerable interest. Now, um... Let's go back and visualize a little bit. So this is kind of what uh, the wall might have looked like. It would have been very dark. And here we have kind of this image of Snowball and uh, this image of Squealer holding the paint pot. And um, this is a, a good time to point out that the seven commandments of animalism also fairly well line up with the main tenets of communism, which was the state government policy of the Soviet Union. And totally unrelated to that, um, milking the cows. Um, I've provided this video. Again, I'm not going to show it to you on my video, but you're welcome to look at it if, uh, if you want to go over to Google Classroom. Um, I want you to think for a moment, where should this milk go? Like, what would be the best use of this milk? And then, ultimately, where does it go? Uh, what is going to happen to all that milk, said someone. Uh, Jones used sometimes to mix some of it in our mash, said one of the hens. Never mind the milk, comrades, cried Napoleon, placing himself in front of the buckets. That will be attended to. The harvest is more important. Comrade Snowball will lead the way. I shall follow in a few minutes. Forward, comrade. Comrades, the hay is waiting. So the animals trooped down to the hayfield to begin the harvest, and when they came back in the evening, it was noticed that the milk had disappeared. So I want you to think about where does that milk go. And then your culminating task for chapter two here is um, to work with your group, and we'll assign groups here, um, or maybe you can assign your, yourself to groups. Um, but I want you to think about our seven commandments. Our societies have a bunch of unwritten rules, but there's a, you know, like there's many written rules, our laws, but the unwritten rules are the ones I really want you to think about. So I want you to come up with the seven most basic and important rules that guide our lives and be ready to defend your choices. Um, and then I want you to think about what guidelines um, most people follow to like think about their life. And jot down all your ideas, right? This is how I would recommend. And then go back and rank the ideas by importance, right? Like be nice to everybody. It's probably high priority, whereas like keep your room clean might be a little bit lower priority. Uh, there's a worksheet to work on, and I'd like to have these illustrated. Um, as usual, materials that make it to the wall get extra credit. Reach out if you have any questions. Mrs. Agnello, out.